I've already spoken a great deal about the game's intro, and how its front-loading of story cutscenes negatively impacted its pacing. What I haven't yet addressed is the story itself. The game is notable for placing a somewhat greater emphasis on its story and world-building compared to Banjo-Kazooie. The much larger cast of NPCs, the heavier use of dialogue, and its prominent and more sophisticated use of cutscenes seem to suggest this. Tui also appears to aim for a decidedly darker tone, killing off multiple main characters right off the bat. Although the concept of making a child-friendly story more grim and serious may seem trite, I actually like the idea of this shift in tone for a number of reasons. First, the change itself is ultimately pretty minor. The game is still full of bright and colorful environments, and the main character deaths are treated lightly, with Kazooie even cracking a joke the moment after Bottles dies. Second, the change in tone seems almost reflective of the maturation of both the game and its audience. Banjo-Tooie replaces the mostly innocent whimsy of its predecessor with dark and sometimes adult humor to great effect. Where Banjo-Kazooie had the player protecting googly-eyed Christmas tree lights, Tui has the player wantonly murder a sentient ice cube to get at the Jinjo within. Where Banjo-Kazooie has Kazooie and Bottles exchanging insults, Tui has the main characters stumbling through conversations with Bottles' wife and children mere minutes after he's died, playing on the awkwardness for comedy. Even the interface seems to reflect this change in tone, as the large, colorful numbers are almost all replaced with stoic white text. It's also worth noting that the story is framed around the morally dubious theme of revenge rather than the more noble goal of rescuing a kidnapping victim. The game is also much more self-aware, with more fourth wall breaks and various nods to Rareware's older games. Unfortunately, I feel that the game makes a number of missteps that prevent it from reaching its full potential as a more character and story-driven experience. The Jinjos and their village are a prime example of this. Immediately after establishing a strong motivation for the player to advance the story in the form of Bottle's death, they're brought to the village, where the redundant subplot of the missing Jinjos is also dumped on the player. I feel it would have been a better choice to have the Jinjo village after the first main level. This would have assisted in the pacing of both the gameplay and the story. The player reaches the first level faster, and the world building becomes a more gradual task, rather than dumping constant exposition on the player within the first hour. Next is the issue of King Jingling. It strikes me as an extremely bizarre choice to introduce a brand new, sympathetic character, only to kill him off within minutes of his introduction. There's no chance for this new character to make an impression or a connection with the player in the brief time they know him. Having him provide the first Jiggy is a good start, but there was so much more potential here. He should have been made into a minor support character, perhaps providing the tutorial dialogues instead of jam jars, or some other function that gives the player at least a little more unobtrusive exposure to his character. Then, perhaps as the player enters a level around the halfway point of the game, they would be interrupted by the cutscene of Gruntilda stealing his life force. In this way, the loss of the character has much more weight to it, and all that would be required is the postponing of a cutscene and the rewriting of some dialogue. This would also give Gruntilda more to do in the main story, but I'll get to that in a moment. It's somewhat telling how little of an impact Jingling ends up having on the story. Banjo and Kazooie have absolutely no reaction to his palace being blasted into oblivion by a giant laser, and dialogue only a minute or two later seems to indicate that they don't even realize it's half happened. These are minor complaints compared to the biggest flaw in Banjo Tooie's story. That flaw is the game's handling and presentation of Gruntilda. In my previous review, I had nothing but praise for her characterization, which was so enjoyable that she practically stole the show from the game's protagonists. Unfortunately, Tui is decidedly lazy in its handling of Grunty as a character. The most immediately obvious change is the abandonment of rhyming verse for her dialogue. On the one hand, it's possible that the change was intended to highlight the shift in tone from a more storybook setting to something slightly darker. A much more likely reason is that the developers simply didn't want to put forth the effort of writing rhyming dialogue. I suppose a lot of this comes down to taste, but personally I feel the rhyming was one of those extra touches that ended up defining not just Gruntilda, but the charm of Banjo-Kazooie as a whole. It's definitely disappointing to see it removed, whatever the reason may be. Far less subjective, however, is the role and actions taken by Grunty throughout the story. Grunty and her sisters intend to use a giant laser to drain the life force of people throughout the world and restore Grunty's original body. The way the plot is set up is perfectly adequate, mirroring that of Banjo-Kazooie with a cutscene establishing the stakes before the first level. The issue is that it never goes anywhere. The laser is fired exactly one time in the first half hour of the game, and then is never brought up again until the very end. 
Admittedly, this is somewhat similar to Banjo-Kazooie, and the idea of the player having a limited time to reach Grunty is artificial in both games. However, Banjo-Kazooie reinforces the stakes of its plot and the threat of Grunty as an antagonist through Grunty's taunts in the lair, as well as its Game Over cutscene. Banjo-Tooie not only lacks both of these aspects, but actively decreases any sense of tension or coherency in the plot by using Grunty in strange and unfitting places. Aside from the main storyline, it seems the developers opted to use her as some sort of universal filler character. On multiple occasions, she's relegated to explaining the rules of minigames wherever there doesn't appear to be a suitable alternative. When Grunty is supposed to be wreaking havoc on the island and plotting to drain the life of its inhabitants, she's instead inanely challenging the player to a high score run in the Pot of Gold, or explaining the rules of a mine-exploding minigame at the bottom of the ocean. This seriously diminishes her role as an antagonist when much of the player's interactions with her are in a similar fashion to that of many other NPCs, including friendly ones. It's even further diminished when making her the operator of a minigame forces her to reward the player with jiggies and other prizes upon their victory. For a character who is never afraid to skirt the rules and behave dishonorably, it does a disservice to her character to make her act this way out of necessity. Even if she rewards the player grudgingly, it just feels like a lazy misappropriation of a character when the use of other characters could have sufficed. None of this is to say that Grunty detracts from Banjo-Tooie. Her dialogue, even without the rhymes, is still fairly sharp and full of personality, and the final act of the game thankfully sees her in a far more active role. The game as a whole simply handled her character far worse than Banjo-Kazooie, and this is a distinction that needs to be noted when comparing the two. As a brief side note, if King Jingling's impact on the story could be considered minuscule, then aside from the intro, Grunty's sisters may as well be removed entirely. It's amusing that Grunty ends up repaying their assistance by dropping giant cartoon weights on their heads, but again, it feels like some potential was wasted here. Considering Tui's heavily increased emphasis on boss battles, I feel it would have been nice to at the very least have some sort of showdown with them. It would have been interesting to see such a fight perhaps make use of the split up mechanic, in a tag team sort of style, considering the pair represent an obvious contrast to one another in much the same way that Banjo and Kazooie do. Instead, the player faces off against them in a trivia competition. They're the driving force of the plot for about 30 minutes, and then do absolutely nothing for the rest of the game. A much stronger aspect of Tui's storytelling is its world building. Although I'm fond of Banjo-Kazooie's levels and their huge variants in archetypes, one aspect that I personally disliked was how disconnected everything felt. The lair does a decent enough job transitioning between these environments, but they still feel very much like disparate parts of the overall world. Tui provides a nice contrast to this, as the entire game world is presented as a single, contiguous location. Even entrances to levels are improved in Tui, replacing the doorway to warp pad transitions with ones that provide continuity from the overworld. Adding to this feeling of contiguousness is the inclusion of direct links between most of the levels. This isn't a minor design feature, and it's one that goes a very long way to reinforce the believability of Tui's game world, as none of the levels exist in a vacuum. The multi-world jiggies, though sometimes tedious and confusing, can be genuinely fun and rewarding, and also serve to lessen any feeling of disconnect between the levels. The overworld lacks the more consistent theming that was present in Banjo-Kazooie, but more than makes up for it with the design improvements it introduces. Musical notes are again used to provide a limit to the player's progress, but Tui's use of them is more indirect and more effective. Notes are used to learn new moves, and these new moves enable the player to progress. This makes the barriers feel even more natural than the note doors in Banjo-Kazooie. Instead of satisfying a condition written on a door, the player demonstrates their ability to overcome physical obstacles, giving a distinct feeling of growth as each new area is reached. Rather than the use of pairs of warp cauldrons, some of which were hidden, Tui's network of centrally located silos makes travel from one point to another nearly instantaneous. In a game as large as Banjo-Tooie, it's practically a necessary inclusion, and I'm thankful the developers didn't ignore it for the sake of extending the gameplay. Although the inclusion of a vastly greater number of NPCs tends to slow the flow of gameplay somewhat through their dialogue, their presence provides a lot of legitimacy to the game world. In addition, the dialogue is well written, and can always be sped up or skipped entirely. This gives the developers greater license to populate the world with a larger variety of characters without drowning experienced or uninterested players in tons of text. Much of the praise for the Banjo games in this regard is simply toward their novel use of sound instead of voice acting, but I feel the dialogue system as a whole is deserving of far more credit. It feels extremely natural, and the two dialogue speeds are perfectly paced. 
It doesn't take much to imagine how much worse the game would be if the speeds were even slightly off. So I feel that a little acknowledgement is probably due. If I have one criticism for the game world of Banjo-Tooie, it would once again be an issue of missed potential with the Jinjo Village. It feels somewhat pointless, being nothing more than a collection of empty houses that eventually become... non-empty houses. I can't help but feel that it could have been made into something more vibrant and interesting without too much extra effort. The village is the starting point each time the game is loaded, so clearly the developers intended to place some extra emphasis on it. But there's no reason to enter the houses before or after the Jinjos are rescued, and aside from a treble clef and a single secret, the village really has nothing to offer. I can think of a few alternatives to the Jinjo village's current design that would have made it more effective. First, an aesthetic choice. It would be far more satisfying to see the village come to life as more Jinjos were rescued. Simply placing some of them outside their houses, perhaps amid some decorative set pieces that made the village feel more like an actual village, would have gone a long way for comparatively little effort. Second, a functional choice. The zombified King Jingling will occasionally give the player small hints if they enter the throne room and wait. Most players are likely unaware of this, however, as there is no incentive whatsoever to re-enter the palace. It would make far more sense for individual Jinjos in the village to provide the player with hints on specific Jiggies after they're rescued. This would provide a little extra reward for every Jinjo the player rescues, making it more of an achievement regardless as to the size of the Jinjo's family. A hint toward a Jiggy is a bonus that isn't quite valuable enough to travel back to the village for, but is more likely to entice players to explore a bit each time they reload their save file, giving a bit more purpose to starting at the village. Instead, nearly the exact same idea is essentially wasted through the use of signposts in Jiggywiggy's temple, which are unlocked through blind luck rather than as a reward. I always felt it was a pleasant surprise to see the Jinjos play such a key role in the first game, helping the player in the last phases of the final battle. Unfortunately, they seem much more irrelevant in Tui, despite having an entire cutscene dedicated to the subplot of them having fled their homes. All things considered, Tui's plot and storytelling are still above average for its era and its genre, but it feels a little self-contradictory. Revenge is being sought by both the antagonists and the protagonists, which may have made for an interesting dynamic if it were explored at all past the game's opening. It boasts a few lengthy cutscenes that show off Rare's ability to present colorful and entertaining, if not particularly deep, characters. However, it also seems they were content to simply use those characters as conveyance tools for the sake of convenience while neglecting their potential as more effective parts of its storytelling. We already know it's possible to do both, as Banjo-Kazooie's simple plot and effective characterization were interwoven almost perfectly with the gameplay. To be clear, I'm not criticizing Banjo-Tooie for not presenting an epic narrative. I just feel that a bit more emphasis on its story, or a better execution of the story that is there, could have significantly elevated the experience. From an audio standpoint, Tui has an extremely varied set of sound effects, far surpassing that of Banjo-Kazooie's. Unique sounds and music continue to accompany each of Banjo and Kazooie's moves, and Banjo himself has been given a new set of sound effects for jumping, rolling, and his backflip. The jumping sound effects in particular strike me as an improvement, feeling much more natural than those in Kazooie. A notable effort is also put into the sound design for the transformations and enemies. The washing machine, for example, uses its set of squeaking wheels and the impact of its landing sound to convey its weight, and every level features unique enemies that are given distinct personalities through the game's effective use of sound. Musically, Tui largely follows in the footsteps of Kazooie. As with the visuals, however, there are a few technical improvements. By combining two separate MIDI files, an even greater amount of musical variance was achieved, with the main area of Witcher World fading between four different versions of its main theme, as well as a completely separate song for the Fortune Teller's Tent. A more subtle but impactful improvement is the continuity of the game's music. In Banjo-Kazooie, with only three exceptions, entering any loading zone would cause the background music to fade out, and the next area's song would start from the beginning, even if the areas on both sides of the loading zone used the same music or melody. <laughs> 
In Banjo-Tooie, the music continues playing through loading zones, and if necessary, a channel fade occurs as the new area is loaded. The only exceptions to this are the loading zones between worlds, and other locations where the music completely changes rather than being a simple variation. The ability to traverse the overworld without the music restarting in each area, and the ability to explore each world with varied songs all playing seamlessly adds a surprising amount to the game. Considering Banjo-Tooie's huge emphasis on creating a contiguous world, this attempt to cohesively link each smaller part of each level is an excellent addition. Compositionally speaking, Tui's music is also quite similar to Kazooie's. It continues the thematic trend established in the previous game by making ample use of tritones, and for the most part, the music is just as solid as before. In fact, only one level theme sticks out to me as being subpar, and it's one I've already discussed. Considering the length and size of Tui's levels, I feel the music is deserving of some praise simply for the fact that it's possible to listen to the same melody for upwards of an hour or more without it growing stale. Part of this is owed to the fact that levels feature more musical variety, but it can't be denied that these are simply well-made songs. Jolly Rider's Lagoon showcases both of these musical aspects as it transitions between the upbeat Towns theme and the wonderfully atmospheric music of Atlantis. Instead of generic boss music, every boss receives an original arrangement of their level's theme. One small touch I especially liked was this area in Glitter Gulch Mine, where the music is channel faded to use the instruments from Witchy World's Space Zone. This is the only such combination in the entire game, and it demonstrates the clear and continued effort to create a memorable and high-quality score for a game that goes far beyond simple background music. The final act of the game is surprisingly similar to Banjo-Kazooie's, although I would say it's much better structured overall. Upon reaching the final level, the player must overcome a few barriers to enter the Witch's Tower. Once they've made it inside, they face off against Klungo for the third and final time, in another fairly easy boss battle. After an amusing cutscene of Klungo calling it quits, the player is thrust into the Tower of Tragedy, another trivia quiz show based on the game. Thankfully, Tower of Tragedy fixes all of the issues introduced in Grunty's Furnace Fun. There are no Grunty questions and no death squares. Unfortunately, it introduces a new, though less significant problem. On questions that involve examining a scene displayed on the big screen, it's possible to buzz in early before the question is read. Doing this means having to guess at the answer based on context alone, which can be difficult. The issue is that the computer-controlled opponents often buzz in early on these questions, and being computers are often able to answer correctly without any context whatsoever. Another disappointing aspect is the lack of variety in the types of questions offered. There are no questions based on the music and sound, nor are there any timed challenges, which is a shame considering how many minigames are featured throughout the rest of the game. Compared to the issues in Furnace Fun, however, these are completely negligible, and even with the imbalanced AI, completing Tower of Tragedy is rather easy. It's also worth noting that while there's not much variety in the types of questions, the questions themselves are incredibly varied, to the point that even playing it over 15 years after its release, I'm still encountering the occasional question that I've never seen before. All in all, Tower of Tragedy is a well-executed improvement, and ends up being better suited conceptually to Tui's larger game world. After the Tower of Tragedy, a lengthy credits roll plays, followed immediately by another series of cutscenes wherein Banjo and Kazooie bring jingling and bottles back to life. Although it's amusing and well presented, it seems to contradict more than one element of the game's story. The excuse given for the laser not being used more than once throughout the course of the game is that it requires a long recharge between uses, yet Banjo and Kazooie fire it twice within a minute. Second, it's clear that Jingling is brought back to life by returning the life energy that was stolen from him. But if he was the only successful target, where did the energy for bottles come from? Furthermore, in Hailfire Peaks, Mumbo uses his magical powers to revive a deceased alien. Did Mumbo simply forget about his ability to bring people back from the dead? I understand that I'm critiquing inconsequential plot holes in a 16-year-old video game about cartoon animals, but I'm nothing if not thorough. And in all fairness, these are plot contrivances that could just as easily have been addressed by poking fun at them in the typical Banjo-Kazooie fashion, 
Regardless, after reviving Jingling in bottles, the player proceeds to the top of the tower, only to likely discover another barrier preventing them from entering the final battle. This seems somewhat reflective of my biggest criticism of Banjo-Kazooie, but the issue is far less severe in Tui. For one, the player is given a prompt that there is another puzzle to be completed after opening the final level, giving them some advance warning that another gate is yet to be opened. In addition, the requirements for opening the final battle are far less comprehensive than those in Kazooie. Assuming that Banjo's double jump exploit isn't used, a minimum of 640 out of 900 notes are required to open the drawbridge, as Banjo must use a protective move to make it across the poisoned moat. This, along with the 70 jiggy requirement to enter the final battle, means that a much larger portion of the game can be skipped while still completing it. Although, again, I feel that it would make much more sense to have the entrance to Tower of Tragedy be the final barrier, the pacing and structure of Tui's final act are a clear improvement over its predecessors. The final battle itself, however, doesn't quite live up to Banjo-Kazooie's, for a number of reasons. The fact that a majority of it takes place in first-person shooter mode is a huge disappointment. Although the other first-person shooter sections were seemingly designed to mitigate the difficulty of aiming at targets above the player's line of sight, the entire battle with Grunty depends on the player's ability to do this. However, moving forward, moving backward, or taking damage resets the pitch rotation of the first-person perspective. The player then has to spend time aiming once again while simultaneously dodging spells and in the latter half of the fight, enemies. This is a completely baffling choice to me. The final battle should be between the player and the antagonist, not the player and the awkward controls. Using the FPS only for a portion or phase of the battle would have been a fine idea, and this issue would have been far more forgivable. Instead, the battle very quickly falls into a somewhat uninteresting pattern of dodging for 15 seconds or so, followed by shooting, followed by more dodging. A brief lapse from this pattern arises about halfway through, when the player has to use Clockwork Kazooie Eggs to disable the digger's batteries, but all this results in is the remainder of the fight taking place in FPS mode. One especially easy way to introduce some variance would have been to force the player into the air, possibly by electrifying the floor. The player could then fire eggs from the air, having to maneuver around projectiles or other hazards introduced by Grunty. Ultimately, it just strikes me as strange for the developers to introduce so many new techniques and to use so few of them in the final battle. Another disappointing aspect is the music. It feels climactic, but also somewhat slow-paced and fairly generic aside from the use of a motif from Grunty's theme. I also feel that the battle suffers somewhat from Banjo-Tooie's larger focus on boss battles, with one in every level. One of the reasons that Banjo-Kazooie's final boss is so impactful and memorable is because of how different it feels compared to the rest of the game. But with Tui, Grunty is simply another boss battle, with a number in a corner that you have to reduce to zero. Although the fight as a whole is somewhat disappointing, there are some aspects that I do enjoy. The fact that Grunty throws trivia questions at the player in the middle of a battle to the death is both hilarious and charmingly unique and I like the fact that it rewards players with a good working knowledge of the game, even in its final moments. The removal of the bottomless pit and instant death is also a clear improvement over Kazooie's final battle. In addition, I can't deny that a genuinely exciting tension is created in the battle's final phase, as Toxic Gas puts a time limit on the fight, followed by an amusing bit of dialogue immediately before the final shots are fired by both sides. In the end, Grunty is once again defeated, and although the protagonists miss the party thrown by bottles, Kazooie provides a shockingly sadistic alternative. Considering the darker tone of Banjo-Tooie, I suppose it shouldn't be that much of a surprise, but it's still a very strange sight to see Banjo, one of the more mild-mannered characters in the series, gleefully kicking the disembodied head of Grunty like a football, and commenting nonchalantly when her eyeball falls out. All the same, the game comes to a close as Grunty once again promises revenge in the game's sequel. Banjo-Tooie is one of the more interesting examples of a video game sequel. It gets off to an extremely slow start compared to Banjo-Kazooie, and the conveyance issues in its intro are sometimes a recurring issue. In addition, somewhat ironically, in the interest of expediting the story, the pacing of the game's introduction is harmed even further by overlong and misplaced cutscenes that could have been more effective had they been used later on. 
Its increase in scope is both a blessing and a curse, as the game world is larger, more interesting, and more interconnected, but occasionally more frustrating and confusing as a result. It also means when a level fails, it fails far more spectacularly. The flaws of levels like Glitter Gulch Mine and Pterodactyland are brought to the forefront in this manner, as even navigating them can be an exercise in tedium. Even my favorite level is one that I enjoy for admittedly subjective reasons, and could just as easily be considered another player's most hated level due to its intentionally obtuse and restrictive design. Tui also misfires on an attempt to include a darker and more complex story by wasting numerous storytelling opportunities and misusing its main antagonist. All of this being said, I feel it's important to consider that the developers of Banjo-Tooie, much like with Banjo-Kazooie, had an opportunity to be successful while doing less, and instead chose to do more. I mentioned before that player expectations for sequels can vary wildly, and as a result, it's impossible to please everyone. But I don't think it would be a stretch to say that many Banjo-Kazooie fans would have been perfectly happy playing a sequel that merely iterated upon its predecessor, rather than building on it. If there are failures in Banjo-Tooie's game design, then at the very least, they tend to be failures of ambition rather than of laziness. But even this sentiment paints Tui in a far more negative light than it deserves. The game boasts an expansive, but still largely navigable world. It includes numerous interesting level archetypes not found in Kazooie, and executes most of them quite well. It also introduces a number of brand new features, some of which suddenly and dramatically change the core gameplay, and yet the entire experience still feels very fun and cohesive. With a few exceptions, the controls and movement are just as fantastic as before, and even feature a few improvements over those in Kazooie, particularly the swimming controls. Various graphical and technical upgrades make the game a landmark on the N64, and the music, while perhaps not as strong collectively as Banjo-Kazooie's soundtrack, still features some excellent work from Grant Kirkhope. In the end, the question inevitably arises. Is Banjo-Tooie better or worse than Banjo-Kazooie? The answer, although perhaps a bit frustrating, is that neither is entirely better than the other. Both games are very fun and charming experiences, but excel in different areas, and will appeal to different tastes. Those with a desire for a more immersive, complex, and fully realized game world will likely prefer it over its predecessor, while those who care more about the core gameplay and prefer simpler, more elegant level design might sooner give the nod to Kazooie. If I had to choose between the two, I would say that Banjo-Kazooie is a more well-rounded package with higher highs and fewer overall flaws. All the same, Banjo-Tooie is a worthy sequel to what is still considered one of the best 3D platformers of all time, and I feel it deserves credit for daring to advance the genre beyond the concept of a game world consisting of completely isolated levels. It's a very worthwhile experience, and even if it stumbles at times, it's still making the effort to move forward. In my next video, I'll be concluding this trilogy of reviews by looking at Donkey Kong 64. I'll also be briefly examining the place that new open world 3D platformers might have in modern gaming. Thanks for watching.